before we go into the presentation, uh, some more shout outs. Um, anyone here from uh, Civitas Learning? All right, well, uh, Civitas is actually one of our, uh, one of our other silver sponsors. Uh, they're a well-funded star SaaS startup based in Austin. Uh, who uh, we are setting out uh, to transform higher education by using big data analytics to radically improve the learning experience and transform academic and financial outcomes. Uh, we're also partnering with leading institutions to create the world's first organizing platform for higher, higher ed uh, data and translate insights from this data into actionable uh, and consumable recommendations that are delivered through our SaaS solutions. Uh, customer base includes the most innovative and top uh, performing institutions in higher education. Uh, the philosophy is simple, hire amazing engineers, uh, give them the best tools uh, and work environment and surround them with a great team uh, and help them deliver amazing software. So looks like they're hiring. Uh, so i look for Civitas Learning uh, at, the, uh, at the swag booth. Um, also, uh, Column, Column Technologies is a privately held uh, global technology solutions. Uh, our enterprise solutions automate key DevOps principles and help customers meet uh, today's digital transformation challenges. Column success is sustained from building uh, long-term relationships, uh, aligning goals with its customers, and collaborate uh, and collaborative business methodologies that integrate people, processes, technology, and support. So, for folks on Twitter, uh, uh, give them a shout out at uh, Column IT. Um, and last shout out is how many folks use PagerDuty over here? Quick show of hands. Almost everybody. PagerDuty is an agile incident management solution, integrates to IT ops and DevOps, uh, monitoring stacks, and improve operational reliability and agility. Um, PagerDuty is trusted by over 7,000 organizations. As you can tell, almost everybody raised their hands um, uh, globally to increase business and employee efficiency. Customer, uh, the company is headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, and backed by leading uh, venture capital firms, uh, Hormitz, uh, Bessemer, Venture Partners, et cetera. So uh, I, I know there's a couple of folks in PageDuty um, uh, at the event as well, so um, feel free to talk to them. Um, one quick thing was I, I put a star uh, before our last talk because we're actually gonna do another, um, another uh, container talk. Is uh, Lee here, Greek Halkati? might have just stepped out, uh, but Lee and I actually run uh, Docker Austin, and um, Docker Austin is, just like the meetup says, it's uh, a whole meetup based on Docker. We meet on the first Thursday for every month, so in a couple of days we'll actually be doing uh, a meetup uh, in town. Um, but Lee's, um, as a part of the DevOps Days meetup things, we're actually doing a talk at 3 or 5 today on uh, a survey of just container orchestrators. So Lee's been doing a lot of work on just kind of like looking at all the different orchestration engines out there. So he's gonna do like a kind of a deep dive on some of that stuff if anyone wants to talk about orchestration stuff. So that's at three or five today at uh, suite number seven. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to uh, kick off our talk and have Bill Maxwell from uh, Rancher uh, talk to us more about uh, orchestration in multi-container applications. So more Docker, more, uh, more containers, uh, and talking about microservices, microservices as well. Let's give them a round of hands. Cool. Thanks, could everyone hear me okay? Good. All right, um, so we're gonna be talking about multi-container applications, um, and sort of to do that, we'll go over kind of what we know, and then sort of you know, what that new paradigm looks like, and then kind of some of the tooling and how to build it, and then we'll walk through some examples on how to kind of build multi-container applications, uh, looking at Elasticsearch and ClariaDB. And so we've been building these boxes, or this, we've had this concept of boxes of, that we've been building for a long time, where we build provision OSs, and we bake them, and we do it with Packer, and we've added configuration management over the years using Chef, Puppet, Salt, uh, Ansible, there's several I'm probably missing. But, and then we've also been deploying code to these boxes. And so we've had this, this model, uh, and it's typically been at like a VM or a server level, um, but you know, we've been doing it and delivering software and applications for a long time. And so Docker kind of came out and made a new box very much accessible uh, to a lot more people um, and really kind of shifted this paradigm. And so people get really excited and they start doing Docker run and they got Docker compose up if they got fancy right away. Um, 
you know, and they run on their laptop and immediately they're running all these cool services. MySQL is running, Redis is running on your laptop and you didn't have to install anything and that's just been really powerful and really well embraced. And so as you're doing that on your laptop though, you're making a lot of assumptions implicitly that basically you're bind mounting directories from your host, you know, to get your code into the application. You're doing Docker links, which um, allow them to talk to each other. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of context that's now locked and assumed to be there based on what you're doing in your laptop. But as you take that to production, which then you know, typically introduces multiple servers, multiple you know, different environment contexts, different configurations, you know, the, the, it changes. And so how do you actually take the containers from your desktop to uh, production setting uh, starts to vary quite a bit. And so the advice is either really, really dense and very, very prescriptive, or it's way too abstract, where you've got these reusable widgets, and you just grab this one here, and you place this one here, and everything's magical, and your application runs in, in the cloud, and life is great. Um, you know, and so the purpose that we're really going for is you know, there's the steep learning curves, there's this school of hard knocks, but what I'm hoping is that we can get kind of an easy learning curve from you know, just kind of your basics of Docker to the concept of a pod um, and, and learn to sort of embrace that idea and be able to deploy applications so that you know, they can be destroyed and recreated easily like a phoenix. And so for the purpose of this talk, we'll just say a pod is a collection of containers working together. Um, there's, Google's got a really great definition of what they consider a pod in the Kubernetes documentation. Um, but we'll just stick with it simple because if you're not using Kubernetes, you don't have their pod. Um, we'll also assume that you've got some other orchestration system, uh, Kubernetes, Swarm, Rancher, you take your pick. Uh, it's not really that important, um, but in these examples, they're going to be in Compose. And so some of the tooling now, though, as we go into production in this new school of things is um, these key value stores. So you've got etcd, console, zookeeper, um, and you've got your more traditional players still, um, Puppet, Chef, um, Ansible, you know, and actually, as Sparefoot mentioned, they're still using salt for some of their configs. Um, but the point is, is you're going to need to be able to generate configuration in multiple environments and sort of be able to get that data and that context, um, you know, in a repeatable way, but from different sources. And so, uh, typically, I like using ConfD. So, just as a quick side note, uh, it's a really cool project by Kelsey Hightower. Um, he's got you define a very simple uh, configuration file. Uh, you write a very simple template, and the nice thing about it is it can read from multiple key value stores. You're not tied to a single one. You're not tied to console or etcd or zookeeper. It reads from multiple, and basically when it comes up, it just pulls those key value data out and dumps it into a template for you. And so the Elasticsearch cluster that we'll look at building, um, you know, is, is a multi-master, or sorry, is a multiple role type of cluster. Um, you've got masters, you've got uh, data nodes, you've got clients, and then you, know, you have your monitoring tool that you apply to it. And so each one of these um, you know, roles has different needs. And so if we take a look at the API for just the Elasticsearch cluster uh, or container upstream, you know, Docker run Elasticsearch and you expose a port and it's up and running on your laptop and that's fantastic, right? Like you can start playing with it immediately. Um, it's definitely got that immediate gratification. You need to make a little minor tweak. The API allows you just to uh, pass a command line parameter and you start changing the behavior of how that starts. If you get more advanced and you need that configuration, it says, okay, take the configuration file and put that in here in the container. And so, you know, that allows you to do much more advanced configurations. And then if you're bringing data along with you and you've got that, um, you know, you have some data that you want Elasticsearch to work on, you know, you put that here. And so if we break that down as to what roles we're gonna need to deploy out into another environment off of your laptop where you're not doing just like a host bind mount, um, you basically now have the daemon, uh, the configuration piece, and then a data uh, storage. And so all together, that is really your unit of deployment, um, what you're gonna need to produce to actually replicate 
and deploy out to uh, cluster production. And so the daemon will just simply say is the upstream container. Um, there's a group of people that manage that and maintain it, and they do it probably better than I would, um, and they keep up with the updates. And so we will just use the daemon container, but I'll show you later how we can change the behavior of that container just using basic uh, Docker primitives. And so our configuration container looks like this. It's a simple busy box container. Um, you can use from scratch if you prefer to use something smaller. I've found that for troubleshooting purposes, having a shell inside these things is just really helpful, um, just from experience. Um, but we're basically just gonna pull in ConfD as a tool. Um, we're gonna add the configuration for those, uh, for that, and then the template files. We're gonna add our own run.sh script, our own entry point, and then set up some volumes. So the data here is um, the configuration in here isn't gonna stay in this container, right? We need to share that with the rest of the containers that we're gonna be deploying it with. Um, I'm gonna set my entry point and then basically this one will just run ConfD. And so the simple uh, entry point that we're overriding basically just takes the run.sh script and moves it into a path. Um, and I do this typically because when you do bind mounts, sometimes if you do them in the wrong order, um, you end up with an empty directory. And so this just sort of mitigates that uh, step. And then so our run.sh script, so we're gonna need to change the behavior, right? Because now we're creating this configuration and this configuration is going to need to be there before we try and start any processes. Um, so basically here we've got it looking for a plugins file so that if we're gonna install plugins into the container, and we're gonna wait for the actual elasticsearch.yaml file to exist uh, because that's where configuration is going to live. And so it just kind of starts and waits and until it's there and then it executes. And the last thing it does is it gets out of the way. It just execs the original um, Docker entry point for the upstream image. And so, that's yeah, a little dense, but here's our compose file and here's how we're gonna kind of put together that pod just using regular Docker constructs. So we're gonna start with our Elasticsearch master. Um, that's gonna be our configuration image. Actually, let me walk it back a little differently, more in order. First, we're gonna lay down the data volumes. This container is just gonna start. It doesn't really need to be running because all it's gonna do is provide us like an anchor where all the volumes are gonna live. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start up our um, configuration, or the actual daem uh, the daemon, and it's gonna take those um, volumes from that data volume container. But notice here I've added a new line, the entry point line. And what I'm doing is I'm starting up, actually the order's wrong, it will start up the configuration container first um, because it's gonna own the network namespace. Um, and then it will start the Elasticsearch configuration. And the line, the Docker entry point line, what that's saying is don't execute what you were originally going to execute, inject this new one. And I'm injecting this new, you know, opt rancher bin run.sh. That's coming from the configuration container. So I'm now able to change the behavior of the upstream container just by, you know, sharing a volume and, you know, uh, overriding its, the basic defaults of the original container. And so that gives us, um, you know, and now the container starts up, it'll wait for the configuration file to generate, and then it will then just execute Elasticsearch the way it's supposed to, uh, with the configuration data that it needs. And so, what this ends up looking like, I shrank a lot. is we've got a bunch of containers, um, but now we have these Elasticsearch containers, and so if we jump into uh, this Elasticsearch container, okay, 
Yeah. Killing me. Uh, demo. They always go. No. I was trying to avoid using Rancher itself, but it will be faster. Here you can see we've got this data volume container. It's not running, it's just off um, and not too exciting. But when we go to Elasticsearch client, so we have a client server. This one is using me. So you'll notice this is the actual Elasticsearch container. And so you'll notice that this one doesn't, hasn't been assigned an IP. And the reason for that is it's actually sharing the same network namespace as the configuration container. And so if we jump in here, can you see any of that? Yeah, it's not too bad. So here you see we've got Elasticsearch running. Um, it's just, you still just have that one process per container that you were going for as a best practice building your containers and if we go to ops for is it ops elastic user share elastic search config, you can see that we generated an elastic search YAML file. Um, and that was generated by our configuration container, dropped in here, and then telling this container that it needs to, you know, which host to reach out for to go talk to its other peers in its cluster, it's not a data node, it's not a master node. This one ended up being a client node. And so here, you know, just by changing some of the configuration at launch time in a, in a compose file, not building new containers, you can change the behavior of the container. And the nice thing is, is now when the next version of Elasticsearch comes along, you just change a compose file with the new version of Elasticsearch, and barring any breaking changes in the config files, you should just be up and running, right? You didn't have to go through a CI CD process of building a new container, uh, including all of the old stuff, and then launching it that way, um, and then having to QA it that way. So, going back and taking a look at another example um, is a Galera pod. So, this one was kind of fun for us to build. Um, but basically, it's Galera, for those that aren't familiar, is a multi-master MySQL database. Um, and so being able to spin one of those up um, was something we wanted to be able to do. And so what we looked at here is um, well the purpose we were using it for, we were using transactions. And from what I gathered, they said, when you do that, just force all your writes to a single place. So we've got this proxy that we've added. Um, we've got a the actual MySQL daemon, um, I think MariaDB, um, the configuration file for that, and then ultimately, again, we got this data layer. And a note about the data, I, we typically use uh, containers, um, but you define these data, you need something in whatever your provisioning system is to actually sort of tie what your data is. So Kubernetes has uh, physical volumes, um, Docker volume drivers can get you other volumes, but Basically, something should represent your data layer. Um, we typically use the container. And so from our configuration, again, this time we're using Alpine. Um, we're pulling in confd. We've got some overriding scripts. Um, we've got a project called GiddyUp. Um, it helps just with some startup tasks and bootstrapping um, as you're booting up your containers and your applications to find context about their environments and where they are running. And so um, yeah, we use that for our stuff. And so our initialization, again, um, is just basically copying our new start scripts because we're changing the behavior of containers outside, um, sharing these volumes. Um, we have a, a wait state where we wait for the scale. When you deploy a service, you know roughly it's going to have five containers in it. 
wait for those five containers to sort of check in and then continue provisioning. Um, that way you get the configuration information you need from all of them. Um, and then exec out into confd for your configuration. And so this proxy container, this is kind of a good example of you know, um, when we put it all together, I can show you, but this is just gonna run and basically take all the requests and forward them to a leader um, based on whatever it uses to elect. And then, um, yeah, it just waits for that to exist and then it runs and forwards um, from port 3307 to 3306. And so the compose for this is a lot more dense. Um, but basically what we're doing here is we have the daemon um, that's gonna, we have the data container again that's gonna start up and create all the volumes for us to use for the rest of the, the containers that are gonna come up. And then we've got the daemon um, that's gonna come up and then it's gonna own the network namespace. And I, I've been using that term quite a bit, but for those of you who are unaware, you can share network namespaces. Basically, every container gets its own unique um, network namespace and it's isolated from other uh, networks on, on the host. So each one can get its own range of ports, each one gets its own IP address, its own virtual interfaces. And so um, using those, uh, yeah, by default, everyone kind of gets their own, but using some of these constructs, you can share them. Um, and for that uh, creates useful things to do, um, uh, useful scenarios for you to exploit when you need to. Um, so it's gonna own the network namespace, and as it comes up, um, then we're gonna have our configuration container write the configuration out, um, and when that's populated, then we'll exec out into the, um, uh, the Galera database will start up. And then the, what we're gonna do now also is insert the, um, this proxy container in there, and it's gonna run in the same network namespace, and it's gonna run on a different port, but basically forward from 3307 to 3306, which is where um, MySQL typically runs on its own. Um, and so in doing this now, like you, you're now basically building, if, if you think about it, you've just built like a mini server. You have like one network, you've got one file system that you're sort of sharing, and you're just adding the components that you need to basically get your application up and running. Um, the unit has really just sort of shrunk down into um, you know, something smaller and, and what you need there. Um, so what that ends up looking like, is you know, here we can see that we've got our Galera nodes and they each own the IP addresses. None of the others actually have an IP. They're all living in the same network namespace. Um, a lot of times if you were using a data container, you could put it in network none mode. It doesn't actually need a network interface at all. Um, and then we've got these forwarders running. We've got these um, databases running. And so here, what we've been able to do is take, you know, each container and change its behavior on startup and run and coordinate the creation of an actual cl Galera cluster. Um, so when these are actually orchestrated, basically they come up and you have a three node replicating master database that's really simple to deploy. Um, so with that, I think that's I don't think I have time to really walk through uh, Galera, but um, I'd like to open it up to any questions um, that you might have on how to orchestrate multi-container applications. Yeah, so, oh yeah, sure. Um, the question is, is I'm building multi-container apps with a compose file and then Rancher understands it. Um, yes, I work for Rancher, so I do a lot with Rancher. But that being said, um, these compose files should 90% work just fine with Docker Compose. Uh, the only reason I say they, the last 10% would need to be, um, you need like etcd or console to feed in the data for it. 
But from that standpoint, um, yeah, these would run as compose files. Because here, we're basically, we're just using the basic Docker primitives. Um, but yeah. And these can be represented in Kubernetes files. They're just, um, they sort of take away some of the container level stuff, which I thought is a little bit more base, uh, more of the mechanical pieces of it underneath to kind of cover. But um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So the question is, would this run on Docker Swarm with, uh, would it be compatible with overlay networks? Um, I want to say yes, but the caveat being is scheduling. Um, so technically, these are all self-contained units, and they should be able to schedule. Uh, Swarm doesn't necessarily have the concept of um, a sidekick to like basically create a unit that would be scheduled together. You know, Kubernetes gives you the, the pod, which is actually you know, basically a shared mount namespace and a shared network, and basically schedules that unit. Um, Rancher gives you the ability to define that uh, loosely. And so Swarm, I think if you were to stack and get lucky to stack enough on one node. Oh, is, is, OK. Yeah, if Swarm has the affinity pieces, then and you could guarantee that these two containers would stay together during scheduling, then yeah, it should work. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. love to. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>